Hi at BookTube, Bill Rutenberg here with the Rutenberg Library. i uh, got Crimson alongside me here, and uh, we were going to do a book tag this afternoon. It's called I Am the Reader Book Tag. Um, I was tagged by Becky and Scott over at Bookish Bryants, and they did a nice job with their tag, and, and uh, they wanted, wanted me and Crimson here to do the tag, so we've decided to do that right now. Um, I will put the the link to those two videos in the description down below, and so you can go check the check out their their takes on these uh, uh, book tag questions. So again, this is the I am the reader book tag, and so the first question on this on this tag is choose one word that describes being a reader. Crimson, you want to take that one? Sure. So I'd say one word that describes being a reader is intelligent because is it it's not only um it makes you intelligent not only does it make you intelligent by reading a book and make you um grow but it's also just an intelligent intelligent choice in general to choose to read a book so that was my answer okay um when i thought about what word describes being a reader you know there's lots of words that could uh, that, that pop into my mind and, you know, stuff that we could say. But for me, I found the word liberation as the, the word that really describes um, being a reader. And, you, you know, that, that feeling of being liberated, it's a freedom. Um, I come from a, a uh, poor background when I, was, when I was a kid. My parents, neither one, one of them didn't graduate high school uh, and of course, neither one of them went to college, and uh, you, you know, we just didn't have a education. Was not when I was real little. Education was not the the top priority. And for me, reading has been a liberation because I can choose to uh, better educate myself, no matter what my you know what my my um, background. Well, my my financial situation, whatever it is, at whatever time in my life. It never costs a lot to read. Um, you know, the, the library is free. And you can always go liberate your mind. You can free your mind from, you know, becoming more intelligent, like what you said. You know, so it could be for a, a um, you know, knowledge gaining. But it could also be to just liberate you from the problems in your life at that time. I, I know when I was a kid, when I was a little kid, uh, you know, I life was a struggle and I went in and out of foster homes and stuff and so for me when I discovered reading that was a liberating moment for me because I could I could uh, escape. escape whatever was going on in my life and and that was always probably probably one of the best things that ever happened to me was being able to figure out how to read and that I was pretty decent at it and you know it just it liberated my life and so um, question number two, what is the very first book you fell in love with? And I'll, t I'll take that one first. So, you know, just kind of going with that first question, as I was talking about, you know, books liberating my life. Well, when I was real little, the first books that liberated my life, and I was trying to, I still have the books. They're in the upper room upstairs, but they're buried by totes and I can't get to them because uh, I was going to show you the books. Um, I did find it, it, there were three dinosaur books. Uh, I remember I was a little, you know, little boys. That's usually what we fall in love with first for whatever reason. Um, <laughs> I did find one of the dinosaur books. Um, it was Dinosaur Days by Joyce Milton, and this, you know, these were just uh, basically scholastic books uh, that we got at the the book fair uh, every year at school. They'd pass around the little paper, and you could order books and. They always, my foster parents always allowed me to order one book every time the paper came around. And so I ended up with three in that first foster home. I ended up with three dinosaur books that I read over and over and over again. And the one, the one dinosaur days is not the one that I read the most. I had one other one that I read. It was actually a much more complicated book and I read it over and over. I don't even know how it hasn't fallen apart. But um, that was when I was real little. And then, of course, you know, in stages, different stages of life, you have, at least for me, different uh, books that 
kind of catapults you to that next stage of reading. And for me, you know, I, I said I was in and out of foster homes all the time. And so Gertrude Chandler's Boxcar Children books oh, became, yeah, yeah, they became one of my favorites because for whatever reason, I felt a connection with those kids. And, uh, with the you know in the very first book and they start they were talking about their background and all this stuff and I I don't know I I loved those books and I read a bunch of them um, and then after I moved uh, you know through my school days and I got into college into the the adult reading the book that really grabbed me and made me fall in love with reading all over again so it's like it's almost like I fall in love all over again because. I don't know how to explain that, but um, anyway, that next one was the Camp Family Chronicles by John Jakes, and I, I found those uh, when I first got married. Uh, I found those when we were in college, and I, I ate those up. I, I read all eight of those in the eight volumes in the series and just absolutely loved them, and I've read them over and over again. I think they're great. I'm an American history teacher, and those follow American history, and so those have always been my love. All right, go ahead. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the very first book I fell in love with was, I didn't really read it myself. It was read to me by my father and my mom. The Little House on the Prairie series. Um, yeah. yeah Four Angles, Wild Earth. And yep, that was our, we'd read a chapter, door. at least one chapter every night for bed for, oh my goodness, it took us to get all those books done, one chapter a night, it took us. Because I guess we didn't read it every single night, but it was, we read pretty often. Pretty often, and it took us probably a year to get through all of them. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. And that was when I was really little. Yeah. And I had read some of them. I had never read all of them. So that was just as much a joy for me as it was for her. We're both getting to know the books. So, <laughs> yeah. yeah. And it, and I'm going to add in, because she's not going to do it, but I'm going to add in another book that she fell in love with. Her first one that she really fell in love with. I actually, okay, when oh, you were you're talking. you to take it over? <laughs> well, okay, so before, <laughs> we're talking about how Diary of a Wimpy Kid, I loved those books because they were just funny. And then when he was talking about Boxcar Children, I think I would read those too. But um, it reminded me of the elementary library, and I was like, kind of in my head thinking of the books that I read when I was younger. And Goosebumps, oh. I read a lot of. I, I think oh. I read all of them. And the Junie B. Junie B. Jones, <laughs> but like there, I don't. know, There's a lot of. I just I read all of those, and that's. I think that's what got me started to really like reading was like um, the suspense of the books. Now, if you read it, it's super cheesy, but like as a kid, it was. Mm -hmm. It was a really fun read. So, um, well, I, yeah. I liked watching her excitement as she read those because, you know, they're, they're fairly quick reads. Very and quick. when you're a little kid and you're reading an entire book and, you know, she, <laughs> she'd read it in a couple afternoons, it seemed like. Maybe it took her more than that, but it seemed like you read, I mean, you just ate them up. And she read, like, I'm pretty sure all of them they had in the library. I did. Because we went to the public library looking for more copies and they were all out. And, and she'd either all either read them or they were out and we'd get frustrated but that was a lot of fun watching mm -hmm. her babysitter's club yep yeah, yep yeah. i read those just watching her fall in love <laughs> with reading was that to me was a treat i i absolutely love that all right next question hardback or paperback well as we had, we'd had this question in another another video i i'll read either one i don't mind either one but I if if I can choose and I can afford it I I go with the hardback I think it looks better on the shelf that's my answer too like mm -hmm. I don't really I don't really care but if I could choose yeah. paperback or I mean, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> I mean hardback <laughs> hardback yeah <laughs> all right so um, number four how has your reading shaped your identity You want to take it's it first, or you want me question. to? You want me to do it? I mean, I guess it's just shaped my identity in terms of like educationally, mm -hmm. like expanded um, my growth in that, and then just made me have different viewpoints on people's lives. Or yeah, I I guess I didn't really think that question through. <laughs> Um, I think, you know, as far as shaping my identity, what I, what I have found is I feel 
first of all, that, you know, as I read more and more, and I, I love to read as many books as I can get my hands on, um, my, my only problem is I don't read very fast, so I, my numbers aren't very, as big as I would uh, like them to be. But anyway, I have found that uh, I find that I respect myself more as far as just the educational purposes of it and how much knowledge I have. I don't necessarily have to have a doctoral degree uh, because I can go get, you know, a lot of that education for myself. Um, and then the other way that I think it's really shaped my identity is like in the classroom, you know, when we're sitting here talking about different stuff and I can, I, I'm always sharing with the kids or I'm trying to share with the kids what I'm reading at that point. And I always try to tie it into the classroom and the new stuff that I learned and how it changed my perspective on things. And I think this has shaped my identity because I think my kids respect me a little bit more for that because I'm not just telling them, hey, he, you go know read what, this. He knows what he's talking yeah. about. It's not like he just skimmed something like in the... The, the books that they require all the kids to read. Like, he's done the research. He knows what he's talking about. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and I like being able to share when kids have questions about stuff. I can say, well, I read in this and this and this book or this and this and this book. And, and you know lots of details about, uh, like, I mean, not just, like, the important historical facts, but just, like, things uh, like what George Washington looked like and how that... All the little rabbit trails. All the little this. rabbit trails, but like that makes the learning even more interesting when you get to know the person that yes. you're learning about. So I, I think that builds, um, with, with my students in the classroom, it builds trust because um, that I was thinking about how it builds trust with, you know, they, they trust that I know what I'm doing or what I'm saying and I mm -hmm. can point them to where I got my information and it, it just builds up that trust in the classroom and the kids and the kids and I, we, or the kids and me, we, we get along better, I think, mm -hmm. because of my, uh, my thirst for knowledge. <laughs> All right. What do you read when you need to be comforted? Me? Yeah. Bible. The Bible. <laughs> Why do you do that? <laughs> I can't prepare that. Okay. I just. <laughs> All right. I have. I actually have the same answer. We were talking about these questions earlier, and well, what if we've got the Bible for both number five and number eight? Because it's going to kind of play in with that one also. But that that's okay. You can have similar answers. But mm -hmm. I'm going to use two different books just for the purposes of the tag. But the Bible does cover both number five and number eight. But um, what do I need? Uh, what do I read when I need to be comforted? The Bible, um, you know, my faith sustains me. God is everything to me. Um, you know, you know, he's my, he's my father. He's my savior through Jesus Christ. And, um, I'm nothing without him. And so when I start to feel down about stuff, for me, I go to the Bible because he's my rock. He, he comfort, he, he comforts me. And it's not only for like, like, I think a lot of us do that for comfort. And then I feel, um, even when we're happy, like, it's not just for comfort, mm -hmm. but for mm -hmm. joy, out of joy, just like. That's right. Um, so anyway, we, we're very grounded in our faith. And, and we, we realize that, you know, we're nothing without, without him. Without him. And so anyway, in my life's taken many twists and turns. And I have learned to rely on God because I am nothing. <laughs> I I just I don't have enough control on it on everything. I have basically no control of everything, and um, God does. So anyway, um, number six, who taught you to be a reader? <laughs> <laughs> I don't think <laughs> I think we all know the answer to that. <laughs> yeah. Well, her kid or her kids. I didn't say that. Her teachers. <laughs> taught her how to how to read but i i would like to think that i helped influence that a little bit he very much influenced in that <laughs> very very much i just i think it's very very important now here's here's my problem is when when i was you know real little um i told you my parents education wasn't the top priority and so that was not i would not say that my parents were a big influence on me when i was uh real little so I actually give a lot of my credit to my first grade teacher at East Buchanan Elementary, Mrs. Kellum. Um, that, 
I struggled in lower elementary for the simple fact I didn't go to kindergarten because it wasn't required at the time. And so I didn't, but most of the other kids did. And a lot of the other kids knew their num, uh, you know, knew their numbers or letters and all that kind of stuff. And I was, uh, I was ignorant. I was a little behind. Not that I couldn't learn. It's just I hadn't had the opportunity. The, the opportunity at that point. And um, so I give Mrs. Kellum props because she helped me learn to read. And oh my goodness, was she a stickler! I wanted to go out at recess and I didn't get my letters right, and I had to stay in. And you guys know the old, the bold lines and little dotted paper right and you had to get your letters exactly right and she made me stay in at recess several times I don't know how many times several times it made sure that I got those right and so for me Mrs. Kellum I if you ever happen to see this I mean <laughs> you are the one that got me going and um and then in third grade when I because I was bouncing around from foster home to foster home and we um uh, I attended Kearney Elementary, third grade. Mrs. Thompson was my teacher. And it was, so, so Mrs. Kellum got me where I learned to read. And then Mrs. Thompson got it where I, I loved to read. And um, it was with her that um, sh she played on our competitive side. <laughs> and I don't know if you guys remember the old book at pizzas. Maybe they still do that. I'm not sure. But they the, did it when I was little. We had this big old chart that hung on the wall and you got little stickers each time you completed a book. And uh, it was me, and I wish I could remember. I'd have to go look in an old, old yearbook to find the little girl's name. But me and this one little girl, we would go sticker for sticker all the way across <laughs> there, and we would leave everybody in the dust on how much we were reading, you know, how many books we were reading compared to the, uh, the other kids in class. And uh, I won a lot of those little races, and I got book it, uh, the Book It certificates and got to go have my own little... Uh, personalized pizza. <laughs> pizza and then a lot of times you'd get those little it was fun because you'd get like the the Star Wars guys that sat on top of the cup and I don't know if you ever or or just mm -hmm. the the glass cups that had I don't know Care Bears or Smurfs or stuff like that and you'd get you know you could buy remember, those extra. Mm -hmm. I remember mom talking about that yeah kind of like she got that. Yeah, I, that don't, was a highlight. I don't think we did that when I was little but I do remember Hi, BookTube. We're back. Sorry about that. We had some technical difficulties. Apparently, you have to clean your phone off when you get too many videos on like, there. Scroll, delete, scroll, delete, scroll, delete. <laughs> so anyway, let's go ahead and finish this tag up. We're almost done. Uh, just two questions left. So number seven, I'm going to let Crimson take this because it was funny. We were, we were discussing these questions and she started to describe uh, what her th the question is describe your dream reading lounge and she goes oh I bet when I describe this we match up perfect and sure enough she started match or er, describing. describing it and we matched up perfect I'm like are you kidding me so take it away describe your dream reading lounge okay so we've all seen Beauty and the Beast the Disney movie <laughs> cartoon you know the moment where the Beast takes Belle into his library that grand, beautiful, open, big library with thousands and thousands and thousands of books. It yeah, throws back the drapes. Th throws back the drapes. Natural lighting. It's beautiful. It's like a ballroom, but with books. It's You're got... dancing with books. Mm -hmm. Yes. That's our dream reading lounge. But throw in a fireplace in there to make it a little cozy. But throw in a fireplace. Fireplace. Throw in a nice, like, old, either oak or mahogany Desk. table. Like a, like a reading table like you'd see in the library, so you could do research. Yes. And then and stuff. a couch and a couple Lazy Boys. A couple Lazy Boys. But they have to look nice because well, can yeah, you it can imagine match. like a Lazy Boy and like a really fancy Okay, library? if we've got enough money to build the Beauty and the Beast library, we've got enough money to buy a, you know some nice furniture, all right? You got to remember that. So, yes. anyway. Yeah, floor to ceiling, like two stories high of Ginormous nothing but bookshelves. Books. And it's got ladders and, you and all the fancy stuff. you got to climb the ladders stuff. to get to the top. And then, and then, and then balcony on the, yeah, on the there's side. a balcony on the second Twirly floor. Twirly stairs, maybe, to oh, go up. Yes. We've got all kinds of stuff planned out when we get rich. When? <laughs> <laughs> all right, so number eight. Last one. What book changed the way you act or see the world? And if you're going to use Bible again, now you have to explain. I don't... 
Oh you got to explain. I so dead. Okay, so. <laughs> Would you like me to go first? I, I, I mean, I While can you're go. Thinking? Okay, go like, ahead. Okay, so Bible, again, this is the question where I was going to have the same answer for two of them. But um, I'd say, especially for um, future times, like the book of Revelations, when it talks about the end of the world, which is like kind of a controversial thing, but for me as a believer, it kind of like puts in perspective of what's going to happen. And um, I think that's like a way of, yeah, the meaning be comforted. And then as scary as it's going to be, as it scary gives, as it's the book of Revelations be. gives believers comfort that we're okay. And it sounds like horrible but it makes me change and see the world as in like it's going to be okay how do you treat people because it says change the way you act or see the world so how do how you act how do you how do you think it affects you and how you treat people well the old golden rule yeah <laughs> <laughs> pretty much yeah um just treating others with kindness showing them jesus's love that um what he has for us and acting it out towards others because you don't know what they're going through, and they might they might need that, you know. Mm -hmm. And I truly believe God puts people in our lives for a reason, and we're sent out as Christians to uh, give His word mm -hmm. and stuff. So yeah. All right. So I'm gonna um, I agree with her on everything she said, but I'm gonna go out on a limb and just just for the sake of the book tag, um, I'm gonna give a different book, and it's Guns, Germs, and Steel by Jared Diamond. Okay, um, I absolutely loved that book. I don't always agree with the time frames that he uses. I, I am a believer, so my time, you know, my my ideas about time frames are are different. But you know, I can I can read something and take that part of the book and kind of put it to the back of my mind. But it's other parts that really affected me and and affected the way I see the world. I always uh, I was always talking to the kids on how, you know, our cultures are all connected around the world. And in this book, Gun, Germs, and Steel, he really shows those interconnections, the interconnectedness of cultures. Uh, he, he shows that there's no one person or group of people that is, one is not better than the other. And a lot of that is uh, because of circumstances. He In the book, he really talks about the around the world the haves versus the have-nots you know those that have uh resources versus those who don't have resources and you know he talks about resources just the idea of geography where you, you know where you live on planet earth that all affects um how well your culture develops how well your civilization develops and so um i i really liked how he showed that and and then how the cause and effect of stuff in world history. I, I really liked that. Uh, and then the other thing is, I like to take that, that same idea and connect it to just life in general. Because I look at my own life, you know, uh, I didn't start from much. I was nothing to brag about. That is definitely for sure. But when I was put into the right environment, I was able to, you know, blossom, to shine. And, uh, and, and it's not because one person's better than the other. It's just opportunities. It's the haves and have-nots. And I really, I really like this, you know, when we look at societies, but it also, you could look at it as, you know, people as individuals. And for me as a teacher, that means a ton because in my classroom, I get all kinds of individual cases and some have and some have not. And this is really, this book really taught me that, to be a good teacher, or at least it played along with what I already believed, it reinforced what I believed, that to be a good teacher, you have to provide for those kids. You have to give them a chance. Because some are just, some are not, some are born as have-nots. But if you provide them that environment that they need, they can blossom and shine. I always, I always say, like with sports, when you get your first time kids out, the kids that have never been out for the sport, uh, they're like, man, why are you recruiting so much? And I always say, you you never know when there's a diamond in the rough. You know, sometimes you find kids that, that can shine when they're given a chance. And I truly feel I was one of those kids. Not that I'm like, woo, but, but 
I do feel that I have come a long ways from where I started. And so, um, anyway, Guns, Germs, and Steel by Jared Diamond. That's why I really, really like that book. I, I like to see how it connects to societies and how it connects to us as individuals. So, anyway, this is, uh, I am Bill Rutenberg. This is Crimson. We are from the Rutenberg Library, and we were doing the book tag, um, I Am the Reader. And we wanted to thank... Becky and Scott over at Bookish Bryant's for thinking of us and, and tagging us with this. We have fun doing this. I hope you've had fun sitting here uh, listening to us. Hopefully you've lasted this long. Sorry about the technical difficulties. Um, <laughs> <laughs> anyway, if you uh, like the video, please hit the little thumbs up down below. Uh, be sure to subscribe to the channel and share it with others. And as always, BookTube, happy reading.